Imagine being the strongest swordsman, but you never saw a sword before. That's the case of Yasuri Shichika, a boy who's been living his entire life on a deserted island with his sister Nanami. They're the descendants of Matsu who created the strongest sword style. Their father was an army general who was banished to the deserted island after stopping a rebellion. So, Matsu used his time to train Shichika to become the strongest swordsman. Shichika never saw a sword before because this martial arts style doesn't use one. Shichika's body is the real and ultimate blade. One day, Shichika goes to fetch water and encounters a young girl named Togame, a strategist for the shogunate. She informs him of her mission. Inviting her in, she elaborates on her purpose. She inquires about Shikazaki, a renowned swordsmith whose blades are famed for ensuring victory. He crafted approximately 1,000 swords, with 12 being of utmost significance. Of these, Shogun Q possesses 988, leaving the 12 most powerful ones unaccounted for. Togame goes on to explain that previous attempts by the government, using either monetary incentives or integrity, have proven unsuccessful. She promises to give Yasuri a unique motive to assist her, love. While they converse, another person arrives, a ninja named Kumori, who is pursuing Togame. As Nanami spots Kumori hurling several kunai, she immediately shoves Shichika and Togame to the ground for safety. Shichika springs into action, chasing after the attacker and encountering Kumori, who brandishes one of the renowned 12 swords named Zedukana. When Kumori tries to strike Shichika, he skillfully deflects the attack with his Kyoturu technique and attempts to shatter the sword, only to discover he can't. Kumori confidently claims that Shichika's Kyoturu techniques won't damage the blade. Just as Shichika sets his mind on proving him wrong, Togame intervenes. She emphasizes the sword's significance and urges Shichika not to harm it. Shichika agrees, but his surprise is palpable when Kumori ingests the sword, indicating he's not ready for a face-off. Seizing an opportunity, Kumori spits a shuriken towards Shichika as a diversion, allowing him to escape with Togame, who's now unconscious. He secures her to a tree. Upon regaining consciousness, Togame is startled when Kumori tells her he's extracted all the information he needs from her. Her shock deepens when she observes Kamori's ability to morph into her likeness, revealing his intention to deceive Shichika by impersonating her. When Kamori approaches Shichika in disguise, Shichika instinctively delivers a swift kick to his abdomen. This causes Kamori to cough up the sword and question the effectiveness of his disguise. However, Shichika clarifies that his reaction was purely instinctual because he's not accustomed to seeing people. Intrigued, Kamori probes Shichika about Togame's intentions with the sword. Shichika reveals that Togame desires the power it holds, aiming to rule the nation. She also carries the weight of her past, being the daughter of Hida Takahito, who was betrayed. Togame had witnessed her father's death, driving her quest for the swords as an act of vengeance. Shichika recognizes the similarities in their stories and feels empathy towards Togame. To match Shichika's physical prowess, Kumori shifts his form to resemble Shichika. Armed with his sword, Kumori lunges at Shichika. However, Shichika outmaneuvers him, employing a powerful Kyoturu technique, and emerges victorious. Shichika discovers Togame bound to a tree and promptly releases her. He presents the sword to her, leaving Togame astonished by his triumph over Kamori. Shichika confesses his feelings for Togame, pledging to support her mission. Embracing this new purpose, he bids farewell to his sister, Nanami, embarking on a sword-seeking journey alongside Togame. Upon arriving in a bustling city, Shichika struggles to identify individuals or faces due to his many years of living in isolation. The duo continues on their quest, pausing at a spot to rest. While there, Togame ensures Shichika gets familiar with her scent, so he can always recognize her amidst the sea of faces. Togame informs Shichika that their next destination is in Aba, where the second sword, Zantu Namakura, resides within Gekoku Castle. The current guardian of the sword is swordsman Aniri Jinkaku, known to many as the Castle Lord or the Masterless Samurai. Togame shares the history of why this sword is their second target. Jinkaku's ancestor, a samurai, went against the shogunate's wishes, adamantly claiming the sword as his own rather than releasing it as instructed. As the pair nears the castle, a grim sight meets them, the freshly slain body of a Minari ninja. The discovery sparks excitement in Togame, as she believes that defeating Jinkaku would elevate her status to that of a hero. On entering the castle, they find Jinkaku sitting solitarily in a room, the sought-after sword by his side. Togame approaches Jinkaku, offering him anything in exchange for the sword. As she's about to enter the room, Shichika spots Jinkaku's intent to strike her with the sword. 
Acting quickly, Shichika lunges to shield her from the blow. Jinkaku, taken aback, is surprised that someone managed to evade his swift and powerful sword attack. Feeling the need to regroup, Shichika steps outside to formulate a plan. He shares a theory with Togam. He wants to see if Jinkaku will pursue them. When Jinkaku doesn't follow, Shichika concludes that the swordsman can't wield his weapon beyond that specific room. Upon their return, Jinkaku inquires if Shichika has devised a Kyotoru technique to counter his zeros and move. Confidently, Shichika responds affirmatively and lunges at Jinkaku using his rose skill. Togame rejoices as Shichika connects his attack. However, Shichika admits that his strike was not full force. Jinkaku agrees, acknowledging that the rose skill attack could have been lethal had Shichika not restrained himself. Togame observes that Shichika, being unfamiliar with combat, tends to deliver gentler attacks. Jinkaku, feeling invigorated by Shichika's moves, declares he's geared up for a real fight. Noticing Jinkaku's prepared stance, Shichika instinctively steps back just as Jinkaku directs five rapid strikes towards him. Shichika spots blood on Jinkaku's arm. Jinkaku clarifies that he deliberately injured himself to imbue his sword with unparalleled speed, rivaling that of light. Recognizing Jinkaku's fervor, Shichika assures him he will now go all out. Before they proceed, Jinkaku seeks a promise from Togame, which she restore in a bat to its past magnificence if he willingly hands over Zantu. Togame admits she can't make such a commitment. Curious, Shichika questions Jinkaku's motive behind his combativeness. Jinkaku, somewhat uncertain, responds that his primary goal is safeguarding the thing dearest to him, the Zantu sword. Acknowledging Jinkaku's sentiment, Shichika makes his move. In response, Jinkaku launches ten swift blade slashes. Shichika, however, deftly evades them and soars upwards. Reminding Jinkaku of his inability to strike an airborne target, Shichika employs his Shattered Blossom technique, delivering a powerful kick from above and subsequently seizing the sword. Shichika and Togame's next destination is Izumo to meet Tsuruga Meisai, the leader of Sanzu Shrine and the keeper of the third sword, Sentu Tsurugi. The shrine serves as a haven for women who have faced abuse. As they are discussing near the shrine's wall, Meisai suddenly approaches them. Upon asking her identity, she introduces herself. Both Shichika and Togame are taken aback by her youthful appearance. Togame decides to converse with Meisai while Shichika explores the surroundings. Togame expresses her desire to acquire the sword in Meisai's possession. This isn't an ordinary sword, it has around 1,000 identical counterparts, which Meisai has distributed among her followers. Togame shares that they have already secured the first two swords, and in both instances, they had to defeat the sword owners. Meisai offers the sword but under certain conditions. Togame then updates Shichika about their conversation. Meisai has challenged them to identify the original among the 1,000 duplicate blades. If they succeed and present the genuine sword, Shichika will face Meisai in combat. Victory means they get all the swords, but defeat will require them to hand over the two swords they already possess. Shichika finds this arrangement unfavorable. Determined, Togame sets out the next day to locate the primary sword among the duplicates. Meisai learns from the women at the shrine that Shichika mentioned their swords didn't seem like genuine Shikazaki swords, sparking her interest in a conversation with him. She approaches Shichika, who is patiently waiting outside for Togame. Meisai suggests they get acquainted while he waits. Curious, Shichika inquires about the nature of the shrine and the reason women there seem to avoid him. Meisai explains that the shrine acts as a sanctuary for women who have faced abuse at the hands of men, causing them to be deeply traumatized. The Shikazaki blades they wear are symbolic and therapeutic, helping them heal mentally. To these women, the Tsurugi sword symbolizes home, making it indispensable to Meisai. Their conversation shifts when Shichika mentions he sees himself as Togame's sword. They discuss their respective kill counts. While Shichika initially claims to have killed two people, Meisai recalls killing 43 which earned her a reputation as a ruthless killer. Shichika later corrects himself, revealing he had killed three individuals, including his own father the previous year. However, their discussion is interrupted when they detect the presence of Kyuazame from Sabaku, a ninja from the Manawa group, seeking Meisai's sword. He confidently boasts about his intentions to kill them. Though Shichika is ready to face Kyuazame, Meisai requests to handle the fight herself. With a swift strike of her blade, she defeats Kyuazame. Shichika informs Togame about his encounter with Meisai and offers to accompany her the next day. However, Togame reveals she's already located the first sword. They present it to Meisai and set the date for their duel the next day. 
When the sun reaches its zenith the next day, their battle commences. Maesai hurls her sword towards Shichika and then dashes away. Shichika gives chase. He soon finds himself in an open area where Maesai ambushes him with another sword. Although he dodges her assault, he's puzzled about the source of her weapon. The chase continues into a forest, where Shichika discovers multiple swords tied to trees. Realizing Maesai had prepared the battleground beforehand, he concludes that these strategically placed weapons are part of the center Yu. Maesai confirms Shichika's deduction and offers him a chance to yield. In response, Shichika questions her faith in the center Yu. She reveals her past, once a strong believer in center Yu. Her faith wavered after a rebellion led by Hida Takahito 20 years prior. The uprising claimed the life of her father, a center Yu master. From then on, she transformed into a ruthless killer. However, a pivotal encounter with the previous Maesai, who pleaded for the safety of the shrine's women as she defeated him, reformed her perspective. She advises Shichika to retreat, asserting his chances of victory are slim. Instead, he darts away from the forest, luring Maesai to a more open battleground. Before they continue, she makes one request. If she falls, he must ensure the women of the shrine are looked after. Maesai then extracts a sword from the ground, which Shichika identifies as the genuine Sentu Tsurugi. As she leaps at him brandishing the blade, he counterattacks with a forceful palm strike, overcoming her. After meeting with one of their messengers, Togim returns to Shichika with news. A month has passed since their battle with Maesai. Their next target is Hakuhei Sabai, known as the most formidable man in Japan. He wields the Hakudo Hari, a slender yet powerful sword rumored to have the ability to shatter the moon. To gather intel on Hakuhei, they send a spy. However, instead of remaining undetected, the spy is discovered by Hakuhei, who then sends back a letter challenging Togame and Shichika to a duel. The duel promptly sets out to confront Hakuhei. Meanwhile, back on the island, three Manua ninjas hatch a plan to capture Shichika's sister, Nanami hoping to use her as leverage to obtain the sought-after swords. As Nanami collects herbs, one of the ninjas attacks her with his razor-sharp claws. Yet, surprisingly, she effortlessly overpowers him, binding him to a tree. Calmly, she reveals her awareness of their intention to kidnap her, attributing their interest to the success of Shichika and Togame's sword collection quest. Nanami removes the sharp claws from the ninja's hands and challenges him to bite down on them. Trying to deceive her, he attempts a surprise attack using the Tsuma Waste technique, but she's quick to anticipate his move and dodges it effortlessly. Subsequently, she forces one of his own claws into his mouth. In this moment, she recalls a memory of her father choosing Shichika as the successor of the family. Her father had regretfully told her that she couldn't be the leader because she was too talented, surpassing what he could teach. Soon after, a second ninja shows up. Upon discovering his fallen comrade, he angrily lunges at Nanami using a swift leaping technique he calls Ninpu. Astonishingly, she mirrors the move instantly, revealing her unique ability to replicate any skill after seeing it just once. She then takes him down using the Tsuma Waste technique she learned from the first ninja. A third ninja appears, seeking revenge for his teammates. He manages to land a blow on Nanami when she's momentarily distracted by a coughing spell, a result of her underlying illness. Nevertheless, she retaliates by using the Ninpu technique she acquired from him and his comrade. As she's about to deliver the final blow with a sword, he pleads for her to grant them a proper burial after their demise. In the meantime, Shichika and Togem successfully defeat Hakuhei. This victory not only earns them the fourth coveted sword but also bestows upon Shichika the prestigious title of the strongest man in Japan. After their triumph, Togame informs Shichika that their next journey will lead them to Satsuma, where they plan to confront Captain Izkira Kanara and obtain his blade. Upon arriving at the pirate's location, Shichika and Togame observe a duel between Izkira Kanara, the captain of the Yoroi pirate crew, and another challenger. During the brawl, a sword shatters. Shichika, unfamiliar with the pirate and his gear, mistakenly assumes the broken weapon belongs to Izkira. However, Togame corrects him, explaining that what he saw wasn't just a sword but Zokutu, an armor meant for protection. Retreating to their accommodation to plan their next move, Togame points out that penetrating the armor will be challenging. She suggests their best options would be to either submerge Izkira in water, rendering the armor ineffective, or knock him into the air. Their strategizing session is interrupted when Izkira himself pays them a visit. Togame attempts to play off their intentions by acting like a casual traveler, but Izkira sees through her ruse, revealing he's aware of their identities and mission. Izkira proposes a deal. If they duel him and win, not only will he hand over the Zokutu, but he will also offer them passage on a ship to Oeri. 
but there's a catch. If they lose, Iskira claims Togame as his prize. Once he departs, the duo resumes their planning. Their attention is diverted once more when they receive a letter from Manua Hau, a leader of the Manua group. Deciding to pursue this new lead, they set out to meet him. Naniwa Hau approaches Shichika and Togame, expressing his frustration over the deaths of six members from his group. Hoping to prevent more conflict, he proposes a truce, he wants two of the twelve swords, and in return, Togame should allow the Manua group to keep them. Agreeing to the ceasefire, Togame is offered valuable information by Manua. He provides locations of some sought-after swords and tips her off about Princess Haidai of Oeri who appears to be making strategic moves of her own. The scene shifts to the battleground where Shichika confronts Izkira. Shichika quickly deploys his Kyoteru technique in an attempt to overpower Izkira. However, his punch barely affects the pirate, thanks to the formidable Yoroi armor. Undeterred, Izkira aggressively retaliates, forcing Shichika to dodge his relentless onslaught. Searching for answers, Shichika questions why his techniques aren't working, and Izkira proudly proclaims the impregnability of his Yoroi armor. Despite Shichika's best efforts using his Kyoteru style, Aizkura remains unfazed. Just as Shichika considers admitting defeat, Togam sharply reprimands him, urging him to persevere and secure victory. Re-energized by her command, Shichika braces himself as Aizkura charges towards him once more. This time, Shichika skillfully intercepts him, managing to hoist Aizkura into the air and forcefully slam him to the ground. While Shichika emerges triumphant, Aizkura survives the altercation. Later, they discover Aizkura's interest in Togame stems from her resemblance to his younger sister. Gratefully accepting the offered ship as part of their agreement, they are unaware of Aizkura's final act of vengeance. He has secretly ordered the ship's crew to steer them toward the frigid northern region of Izo. Shichika and Togame unexpectedly end up in the icy terrains near Mount Odori in the Izo region. Concurrently, Kaiyuken, a leader of the Manua group and furious over the deaths of her members, learns that the duo is heading to Mount Odori in search of the Saudu Kanazuchi sword, guarded by the Aitsora clan. While trekking, Shichika faints due to the extreme cold. Out of nowhere, a cheerful young girl named Kaneyuki Aitsora appears and, showcasing her immense strength, drags both of them to her residence for shelter. Elsewhere, the Manua group's head is set on acquiring some swords before Togame can get to them. Inside the house, Kaneyuki introduces herself. When Shichika and Togame express their intent to meet the Aitsora clan to inquire about the sword, she somnily reveals that her entire clan is deceased, leaving her as the sole survivor at just 11 years old. Upon hearing about the Saudu Kanazuchi, Kaneyuki recalls mentions of such a sword and offers to retrieve it for them. As she departs, Shichika confides in Togame, revealing that he's aware of her lineage as the daughter of Hida Takahiro, the mastermind behind the rebellion responsible for his father's exile. Kaneyuki soon returns, bearing a sword. Skeptical, Shichika and Togame doubt its authenticity. To prove its legitimacy, Kaneyuki challenges them to lift it. To their astonishment, they find it impossible due to its immense weight, indicative of the legendary strength of the Aitsora clan. Kaneyuki declares that she must battle them before handing over the sword, as instructed by her deceased siblings. She initiates a duel with Shichika, impressively using the sword to slam the ground, creating a large indentation in the snow. Shichika faces a dilemma, he can't harm her as they require her strength to transport the sword. In their duel, Shichika's initial strike misses, but he quickly tries again, landing a hit on Kaneyuki. Surprisingly, she emerges unscathed, leaving both Shichika and Togame in disbelief. As Shichika contemplates his next move, Kaneyuki aggressively swings her sword at him. He evades her swings, but she skillfully changes the direction of one of her attacks mid-air, catching Shichika off guard and injuring his arm. Concerned for his safety, Togame intervenes and stops the fight, marking Shichika's first ever defeat. While Shichika receives medical attention, Kaneyuki visits the graves of her kin, only to encounter Kaioyukun. Using her unique ability, Kaioyukun infiltrates Kaneyuki's body and accesses her memories, uncovering the tragic fate of the Aitsora clan. Kaioyukun challenges Shichika, seeking vengeance for her fallen teammates. However, Shichika anticipates her moves and successfully strikes her. Contemplating a different strategy, Kaioyukun considers possessing Togame. Togame quickly responds, instructing Shichika to eliminate her should Kaioyukun take control of her body. In the ensuing clash, Shichika targets Kaioyukun's tattoo, forcing her spirit out of Kaneyuki's body. Togame expresses her relief at Shichika's growing compassion, noting how he takes care of the unconscious Kaneyuki, placing her in a cave to shield her from the cold. 
Soon after, other leaders of the Maniwa Corps show up. They express regret over Kaiyukin's actions. In a gesture of goodwill, Hau kills Kawasuo, as he possesses a unique skill that could unfairly benefit the Maniwa Corps in their quest for the swords. Wishing to avoid further conflict, Tagame accepts their apology. Before departing, Hau shares concerning news with Tagame. The ownership of the Shirezen sword has transferred, and the new owner has already caused significant bloodshed since obtaining it. In gratitude for their understanding, Kaneyuki agrees to transport the heavy sword to Ori on their behalf, and then plans to head to Sanzu Shrine. Shichika and Tagame arrive at the Mount Seibashiri Tosa Temple, seeking the Akutubita sword, known for its healing properties. When they meet Nanami, she reveals that she obtained the sword specifically to see Shichika, and won't easily hand it over. She challenges Shichika to a duel for the sword. Ready to fight, Shichika waits for Tagame's signal to start. However, as soon as he lunges at Nanami, she swiftly avoids his strike and leaps into the air. Shichika chases her, but she consistently evades him. Nanami warns him that his past victories don't necessarily mean he's improved. With her ability to copy skills, she's well aware of his tactics and vulnerabilities. When they touch down, Shichika attempts another move, but in an instant, he finds himself pinned to the ceiling. Confused, he questions how Nanami managed this, especially given her seemingly delicate physique. In response, Nanami admits she's responsible for the massacre of the Aitsora clan, implying she has acquired their formidable strength. She explains she has defeated and mimicked many individuals while searching for him. Furthermore, Nanami reveals she has even replicated Shichika's moves and has identified a specific vulnerability in his fighting style. Though she considers sharing this insight with him, she ultimately chooses not to, noting he has evolved during their time apart. In his current state, Nanami boasts she could beat Shichika using just her little finger. Doubting her claim, Shichika lunges at her but she swiftly subdues him, revealing she held back from delivering a fatal blow. Questioning how she's able to battle despite her health issues, Nanami reveals the Akutu sword embedded in her chest. She challenges him to return once he's stronger and exits the temple. As Shichika grapples with the emotional burden of potentially fighting his sister again, they recall their initial journey to the temple, prompted by Haidai's servant, Soda Imanziman. To counteract Nanami's copying abilities, Togame devises a strategy, battling in darkness. When she tries to reason with Nanami, she learns about their family's tragic past, including their father's exile due to the murder of his wife, a member of the powerful Tetsubai family. Togame arranges another duel between the siblings at the Buddha temple. Upon arrival, Shichika, holding back questions, is instructed by Nanami to approach their fight with genuine lethal intent. As the battle commences, all light sources extinguish, revealing their tactic of fighting in obscurity. Despite the disadvantage, Shichika manages to land a strike, retrieving the Akutu sword and handing it to Togame. However, the confrontation doesn't end. Nanami unexpectedly attacks Togame, slicing off her lengthy hair. In the ensuing chaos, a lantern falls, setting the cut hair and temple on fire. Shichika, previously hesitant, finds renewed determination after Nanami's assault on Togame. In an intense showdown, with both dodging blows, an emotional Shichika eventually lands a fatal hit on Nanami. While journeying to Ori, Princess Haidai dispatches her servant to fetch Shichika. Togame tags along, and to their surprise, instead of hostility, Haidai provides them with a lead. She points them to the Shikazaki Kiki workshop by Lake Fayu for their next sword and directs her servant to accompany them. Upon reaching a desolate village, they encounter a peculiar sight, a doll brandishing numerous swords. Togame identifies one of the swords as Biriku. Observing the doll from a distance, they notice it appears to be guarding something. Togame deduces they need to conquer the doll to access the Shikazaki workshop. To gauge the doll's capabilities, Togame instructs Shichika to approach it. When it aggressively responds, they discern the doll itself is a unique sword named Bidukanzashi. Over the next couple of days, the duo makes repeated visits to the site to study the doll's behavior and determine the workshop's location. In one of their strategies, Togame proposes digging a pit trap in the doll's path. However, instead of being ensnared, the clever doll leaps over their trap and decides to sunbathe. Heading back to their accommodation, Shichika expresses confidence in overcoming the doll without having to damage it given that it's also the sword they seek. Togame assures Shichika she'll devise a tactic to outsmart the doll. Acting on her plan, Shichika engages the doll in combat, intentionally avoiding its chest and head. Although he attacks, the doll consistently defends itself. Their strategy, which involves making the doll constantly defend, seems to work. During the fight, Shichika recalls his father likening him to a sword. 
he observes to Togem that the doll is much like him, emotionless, merely obeying commands without feeling. As the intense battle unfolds, Shichika begins to tire and sweat. In a surprising move, the doll adopts a flying attack mode, targeting both Shichika and Togame. Rushing to her aid, Shichika vows to defend Togame, driven not just by her orders but by genuine concern. Eventually, the doll exhausts its energy and shuts down. As it descends from the sky, Shichika catches it. Togame explains that the doll regains energy during its sunbathing sessions. After retrieving the sword, they pack the doll and ship it off to Haidai. She had hoped the duo would meet their end at the doll's hands. However, with the challenge behind them, Shichika and Togame stay by the lake, continuing their search for the workshop. Shichika and Togame meet with Kaguchi Zanki, the leader of the Shinuisu school, to negotiate for the ninth sword, Aotu Nakajiri. In their initial encounter, Togame bests Kaguchi in a game of shogi, so Kaguchi agrees to battle Shichika for the sword. However, Kaguchi insists she won't fight someone who doesn't have a weapon. To level the playing field, Shichika dons protective gear and wields a bamboo sword, but Kaguchi quickly defeats him. Back in their room, Togame suggests that Shichika should learn sword fighting. Shichika counters that using a sword will weaken him, not enhance his abilities. Moreover, he argues that he's not skilled with swords, while Kaguchi won't fight without one. Recognizing this impasse, Kaguchi offers to teach Shichika swordplay to ensure a fair fight. Though hesitant, Shichika starts his training. Meanwhile, the remaining leader of the Manua Corps, who Manua discovers another sword, the Dokudo Meki. During Shichika's initial training session with Kaguchi, an insect lands on his head, which Kaguchi tries to remove. Togame walks in on this scene, misinterpreting it, and becomes jealous, thinking Shichika might have feelings for Kaguchi. Simultaneously, Haidai orders her servant, Imanziman, to track down and eliminate Humaniwa. Imanziman locates the three Manua leaders as they inspect their newfound sword. When Shichika comes home from training one day, Togame, feeling jealous, orders him to halt his lessons with Kaguchi. She proposes they use an unexpected tactic to win their upcoming duel. To make him forget about his training, she kisses him. On the day of the duel, Togem faces Kagachi in a game of shogi before Shichika's match. As the bamboo stick fight is about to begin, Togem points out a mistake in Shichika's grip. However, as the fight starts, Togem begins recounting all the moves Kagachi used in their shogi game. Kagachi becomes mentally distracted by Togem's comments, her concentration broken. As she struggles to focus on the duel and shake off Togem's words, Shichika seizes the moment to strike her on the head. Having won the duel, Kaguchi hands over the sword to them. Shichika and Togame journey to a mountain, a place imbued with personal memories for both of them. Their goal is to find Higaki Rins, a holy man who possesses the sword, Seidu Hakari. When they encounter Higaki, he appears to Shichika as a young girl, while Togame sees him as her father. This vision of her father unsettles Togame. Higaki informs them that the sword they seek is buried beneath the ground. Meanwhile, the remaining two members of Minawa press on with their quest. As Togem begins to dig for the sword, Shichika engages in conversation with Higaki. During their talk, Higaki's appearance shifts, taking on the visages of various adversaries Shichika has faced before. Elsewhere, Haidai instructs her servant to gather information about Togem. Higaki then leads Shichika to a battle location. As Shichika duels with Higaki, he notices that Higaki is merely evading his moves rather than actively fighting back, seemingly analyzing Shichika's combat style. Realizing this, Shichika decides he won't continue playing into Higaki's hands. Higaki challenges Shichika, telling him that he should have gleaned some lessons from their duel. If he hasn't, Higaki won't offer any further guidance. Higaki probes Shichika about Togame's true intentions and questions his motivations for fighting. Higaki points out that their determination doesn't justify the number of lives they've taken. Rushing back to Togame, memories of their shared journey flood Shichika's mind. He realizes that he battles for Togame's sake. Reuniting with her, he shares this revelation. Together, they unearth the Seidu Hakari, a sword designed to harm its wielder rather than opponents. It serves as a tool for self-reflection. Returning to Higaki, they present the bladeless sword, emphasizing its non-lethal design. Higaki then reveals a secret. After the creation of the Twelve Swords, a master weapon emerged, the Kyoto Yasuri, Kyotoryu. This sword represents Shichika's own family lineage. As they set off in search of the next sword, they encounter an injured penguin, one of the Manawa leaders. Desperately, she pleads with them to assist Hau. A tale from long ago is recounted. It appears that Shikazaki once encountered Yusari Kazun during a training session and proposed to assist him in becoming unparalleled. 
Meanwhile, Imanziman confronts both Hau and Penjin, challenging Hau to combat. The two engage in hand-to-hand -hand combat, revealing that they share the same ninpu techniques. To tip the balance, Penjin tosses a newfound sword to Hau. With the sword's power, Hau overpowers Imanziman. However, the sword's influence corrupts him, leading him to injure Penjin. Shichika and Tagame stumble upon the wounded Penjin and transport her to a shelter. After hearing her story, they deduce that the bewitching sword is Dokutumeki and that it has ensnared Hau's mind. After ensuring Penjin's safety, they set off for New Manawa in hopes of locating Hau. En route, Tagame speculates to Shichika that the final sword, in Tuju, might be in Haidai's possession. Back at the shelter, Imanziman seeks Tagame but finds Penjin instead. Drawing the Intuju, he intends to end her life. Penjin confidently claims that she's impervious to projectiles because of her secret ninpu technique, Unmeikyuzashi, which causes bullets to swerve around her. Unfazed, Imanziman discards his gun and strikes her down. When they reach New Manawa, they encounter Hau, but it's clear that Shikazaki now controls him. Declaring his intention to alter history, Shikazaki proclaims that any cities or people not meant to exist will be obliterated. Shichika and Shikazaki engage in combat. Despite Shichika's aggressive approach, Shikazaki evades every strike. Launching himself into the air, Shikazaki forcefully embeds the sword into the ground. Nearby, Shichika observes a plant withering from the sword's impact. As the fight progresses, Shichika skillfully sidesteps each of Shikazaki's offensive moves. Realizing that Shichika is not using his full strength, Shikazaki remarks on it. However, using a concealed technique, Shichika manages to pierce Shikazaki with his bare hands. They were preparing to head to Oori when Imanziman approaches them. As Shichika prepares for a potential skirmish, Tagame and Imanziman converse. Suddenly, Imanziman addresses Tagame by her true identity, Princess Yausha and without warning, draws his firearm and shoots her. Imanziman informs Shichika that Tagame is clinging to life, suggesting they share one final moment. Desperate, Shichika pleads with Tagame to stay alive. However, Tagame confesses that she never truly intended to journey the world with him and that she had only used him. She admits that had she lived, she would have eventually killed him. As her final request, she tells Shichika to move on without her and asks if she, too, might have genuine feelings for him. She then succumbs to her injuries and dies. Meanwhile, Haidai meets with the Shogun. She presents him with the swords and identifies herself as the last descendant of Shikazaki. She shares with the Shogun Shikazaki's ambitious plan to rewrite history. Their conversation is interrupted when Imanziman bursts in, warning them of Shichika's presence in the castle bent on vengeance. As Shichika effortlessly dispatches the guards sent to halt him, the Shogun, alarmed by Shichika's reputation as a Kaiocharyu practitioner, questions if he can be defeated. Imanziman admits that Shichika is virtually unstoppable. Haidai then reveals to the Shogun that Shichika plays a crucial role in Shikazaki Kiki's grand design. She advises that their best chance to thwart him is to deploy the eleven retainers along with Imanziman. The king dispatches his retainers, each armed with one of the twelve Shikazaki swords. The first retainer steps forward wielding the Zedukana, a sword said to be unbreakable. However, Shichika shatters it. The second retainer brandishes the Zantu Namakura, the same sword Jinkaku once used. Shichika touches and breaks it. The third retainer challenges him with Meisai's Sentu Tsurugi, which can create 1,000 duplicates. Shichika demolishes them all. The fourth retainer hopes to claim the title of the strongest man by using Sabai's sword. But Shichika shatters the Hakutu Hari. The fifth retainer confronts him with Zakatu Yoroi, a defensive armor sword. Shichika lifts the retainer, delivers a powerful punch, causing the retainer to explode midair. Next, a retainer comes forward wielding Aizora's heavy sword, using a special ninpu technique to lift it. Shichika overcomes the ninpu and breaks the sword. He then faces off against a retainer armed with Akutu Bita, a sword he had previously taken from his sister. Combining techniques, Shichika delivers 272 punches to defeat the retainer. He then confronts the Bidu Kenzashi, a sword accompanied by a doll. Spotting a weakness, Shichika easily overpowers them. He moves on to challenge the retainer wielding the Aotu Nakajiri, then the bladeless sword they had obtained from the holy man, Seidu Hakari. He finally faces the retainer with the eleventh sword, Dokutu Meki. As with the previous encounters, Shichika effortlessly defeats each retainer and shatters their swords. Finally, Shichika confronts Imanziman, who stands beside the princess, guarding the final sword. Before engaging in combat with Imanziman, Shichika vividly recalls Tagame's face. He confesses to Imanziman that he battled in Tagame's name and, despite her urging him to move on, 
he now desires to die. The Monzeman fires shots at him, and, to his astonishment, Shichika appears to dodge every bullet. However, Shichika clarifies that he didn't dodge them. The two clash fiercely, drawing upon all the combat techniques he's mastered. Shichika overpowers and defeats Imanzeman. He then approaches Haidai and the Shogun. Focused on the Shogun, who had commissioned Togam's mission, Shichika kills him. But Haidai's plan to overthrow the Shogunate and alter the course of the future doesn't succeed, as another Shogun takes the throne. The story concludes with Shichika journeying across Japan, accompanied by Haidai. Watch this next video. See you on the next one.